What's up designers? Welcome back to the studio. Um, we're at a really fun place in our cut paper projects. Um, let me explain kind of what I'm talking about there. Uh, we've spent a lot of time working on these um, folded motifs and sort of small exercises and these are great um, especially uh, because they sort of free up some mental space uh, to really kind of start to imagine uh, what could this be? Um, as an artist, I'm always kind of like caught in this somewhat awkward position where I'm working in the studio, somebody drops in to kind of see what's going on, and they kind of step back, give a little head scratch, and go, what is it? And like, there are certain times in the art making process where I think that's a really important question. Um, generally though, it's kind of a buzzkill in the studio. Instead, um, uh, where like artists and, and poets and designers are oftentimes thinking in terms of not so much what is it, which is sort of like a singular or kind of like a convergent thinking, right? Where uh, answers should all sort of start to end up in one place. Questions like what could it be um, are a lot more divergent, right? Where uh, artists are thinking about how many different possible things could this exist as. Um, when you start to really kind of survey all the stuff that we were working on over the last couple weeks, um, hopefully your imagination has started to trip and um, you're getting beyond this, okay, Mr. Beck's just trying to teach me another technique to Mr. Beck is trying to free up my mind to get me to think expansively about what else can paper represent or where can kind of simple exercises like folding paper, where can that take my mind and take my imagination? So I've got a couple examples of what I'm talking about here. Um, I've got one that a student designed for me last year, um, and this thing is uh, basically a simple iteration or adaptation of one of the folds that we've got. And so I'll kind of talk through, you know, where this thing takes me in my imagination. Um, I've got a couple other ones here that um, I've worked up on a smaller scale where I linked a few of them along a piece of, um, piece of uh, steel rope and uh, they start to feel a little bit more like um, biological, almost like spinal cord. Um, I've got some other ones that um, I was starting to think about last year, and uh, I'll demonstrate out in terms of how uh, I want you guys to approach this project. Um, we go from simple concept uh, with a few sketches to a prototype to a final um, to a final edit. So let's uh, let's jump into this project and really kind of see where um, where it takes us. I really kind of want you guys to be thinking about the, the, where we began, right, and and how our basic folds might expand. And so I'm going right back to this to the very uh, first Paul Jackson text that we used, and come back to a design um, in his sort of releasing the folded edge or releasing the cut edge uh, design. This would be page 67, um, which is a, a design I've come back to a couple times because of the deceptively complicated measuring involved, and I just sort of like the challenge of making this one come to life. Uh, it's a piece that I've done on sort of a small scale with just a few, um, you know, a few folds, like he has it laid out in the text. Um, but what I was really thinking about is what could, what would happen if I started to sort of stitch together multiple pieces of paper, or um, maybe instead of just having a single plane of folded forms, what would happen if I had multiple planes of folded surfaces? Now, to get to this point, though, uh, what I'll call somewhat more of a finalized piece. Um, it took me a lot of sort of trial and error. So the first thing I had to do was fold out the original, right? I mean, this maybe goes without saying is uh, we've been using the sketchbook paper all semester long to kind of rough this in, but um, this is sort of cheap paper to practice with. But once you kind of get the feel for it, uh, in the small design, you'll have to kind of lay out um, larger, uh, larger iterations and work them out on a larger scale. Um, one of the ways that we could sort of expand on our basics, right, is to increase the size. Uh, one of them would be to sort of repeat the same form over and over and over again. One of them could be gluing forms together. One of them could be um, stacking forms together. In this case, I've done a few. Uh, I've increased the size of the final piece to a full page of sketchbook paper or so, and um, I've repeated the form multiple times. Last year when I designed this one, I treated it like a triangular prism, right? So that there are three sides with a hard crease that make a prism shape, and then the corners sort of leaf out into these sort of, I like to think of them as almost um, like key and lock sort of arrangements, the way one piece would fit into the other. Uh, in this 
sort of iteration though, I think what I'll try to work on is a tubular approach or a cylindrical approach so that I'll be, instead of folding the, uh, the design, working, um, working with a cylindrical form and then folding out the sort of keys on the edges. But it was really important for me to work out all my measurements in pencil and pen first and it also really helps me see it. The reason why is we're not going to use sketchbook paper for our final iterations. This final iteration was done in tag board. You can sort of uh, feel the thickness in the paper of a finished design like this and it also has a much crisper fold. In order to do that we'll have to grab folders down uh, that I sent home with you and you're gonna have to go digging to find your tag board. It's probably not a bad idea to grab that tag board out and just kind of figure out how big of a piece or how much of it you have available to you. The tag board, so that you know which one it is, has a nice smooth finish on both sides. It has sort of um, a thicker sound to it and um, it's the same material that your 3x5 note cards are made out of more or less. Um, I've pre-cut one, two, three, four pieces of about nine by 12 inch uh, tag board for you. That's the extent to which you have to work with. Uh, if you've got a big grand concept and you wanna work it up on a large scale, I'm gonna force you to do it on a smaller scale first. And then we can talk about larger scale for later on in the semester. Um, I would say start by considering basically more or less one sheet of your nine by 12 as what we'll work with for this final project. That keeps it small enough that you guys won't end up spending, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks on this. What I essentially want you guys to be thinking about is we'll do, we'll be doing this uh, for this week and next week, no more than about seven days worth of class time on this final iteration. So how do I get from, you know, in the Paul Jackson text to a finished piece? Well, it's all gonna start with a concept. I know that sounds crazy because we've been doing so many exercises, but I'll say pause on the exercise idea and come back to the concept. Um, basically, I want you to look at what you have, um, have what you folded out so far and um, start to kind of ask yourself that question. Not what is it, but what could it be? Could it be a wearable piece? Could it be something that um, is a form of fashion or clothing? Could it be a form of body armor, which is kind of an extension of the world of fashion? Could it be of some sort of vehicle? Um, this is where I want your mind to start to run. And I'll give you an example of sort of where my mind went when I started folding these together into larger forms and um, some uh, ideas I had, right, for this uh, student piece that as he kind of created an iteration, it's sort of a cylindrical iteration of, uh, of one of our fold practices. Um, I really enjoy designing domestic objects. I think um, we live around objects all the time and it's very interesting to sort of engage them and pick them up and have access to them all the time. So something like a lamp or a piece of furniture or something um, uh, that is found in a domestic space is a really interesting design challenge. What would this cylindrical form look like if it uh, be sort of became something like a lamp? And so I started to sketch out some ideas. And here's where I want you guys to begin. What would it look like? Or how could it kind of be arranged to have this sort of either uh, prism-like form or this sort of larger cylindrical form as a, uh, as a lampshade. So let's just say, for example, I, um, I need a base and uh, I need some sort of post and my, and my prism-like lampshade would come down around the outsides And so, you know, here's one concept, right? That's not too bad. Um, I, uh, I have a similar concept, right, for something like this kind of angular piece. I mean, what would that one look like with a similar base? And these concept sketches are really nice because they're fast. Uh, it doesn't cost me a whole lot. It costs me, you know, whatever the ink is in my pen and the paper it doesn't cost me hardly any time. Um, I, I just sort of find sketching and quick renderings to be um, a really wonderful way to quickly imagine the world. 
uh, if drawing is sort of a complicated, um, it's a little bit too, you know, over your head, or you feel like, you know, using drawing to achieve sort of basic forms like this is, you know, just outside of reach, that's okay. Maybe do some uh, cut and pasting with photographs or, um, you know, a combination of both, right? Drawing and photographs. Um, whatever you need to do to get your idea on paper, that's going to be important. If you need to sort of cut and paste screen capture or print something that's in the Paul Jackson text and draw directly on it into your sketchbook, um, that's okay. Right now you guys are art students, we're practicing, we're learning from other masters of the craft, uh, so use whatever drawing or collaging technique you need to get your concepts on paper. So now I've got um, a concept of what I would like the you know I would like to have happen in the future I, I have something that I don't exactly know how to do but I'm gonna start working towards it this is how um, you would I start to um, start to work on larger and larger iterations of my piece uh, these I call not concept sketches but these I would call prototypes prototypes are really critical uh, learning process steps or steps in the learning process um, if you don't do your prototypes, you end up failing on a much larger scale and you fail with um, expensive materials. Sketchbook paper is cheap, pencils cheap and easy to erase, so I'd rather fail here than fail with my tag board. If you find yourself sort of stuck at this beginning process, um, you just can't imagine, right? You just can't think through, you know, what would this look like as, uh, or what could this be? Um, I'm going to share a couple of other artists with you because I find that even um, having worked as an artist and a designer for you know years and years and years and, and having lots of projects behind me in my past, there are these times where I just kind of hit this, um, this kind of block where I can't see past the paper in front of me. It just is what it is. Uh, at that moment, I, I reference art history or I reference other contemporary art makers and every time I do that, every time I look outside of myself and, uh, and engage other makers, other artists, other designers, I just get blown away by the amazing things that paper can be or whatever material I happen to work with. Here are a couple examples. For starters, uh, the artist who goes by the moniker Polly Verity has these amazing geometric uh, sort of Bauhaus influenced designs. But the ones that I'm kind of particularly excited about are these really organic portraits. I can't believe they um, that she has achieved that sort of work. Um, with flat sheets of paper. Li Hongbo's work um, really is kind of a totally different direction. The two examples here um, are his paper gun project, which um, almost have this sort of playful kind of party-like feel to them. This room is full of something like 2,000 uh, paper guns, and when they open up, um, it totally kind of undermines the sort of severity of these objects. Um, the other one that Li Hongbo is sort of uh, virally famous for are his hyper-realistic uh, paper sculptures that just sort of pull out into these absurd and kind of whimsical, playful, sort of almost hilarious um, tubular paper structures. Ishar Gafni is a bit of an odd duck, right? An Israeli engineer and um, paper designer. Uh, he had this idea a long time ago for uh, designing a paper bicycle. And sure enough, actually designed a bike. It's fully fabricated out of cardboard with just a couple metal components. And um, even though it didn't exactly make it to market, uh, is a fascinating kind of idea. Matthew Shillon is um, a sculptor who I think has one foot sort of in the world of paper objects and one foot in sort of the world of computer-based design. Even though all of his paper objects are sculptures in the real world, they feel very much infused with the kind of digital uh, culture that is um, very 21st century, I think. And finally, uh, Peter Demann is a German uh, paper engineer and a pop-up artist, and uh, he talks a lot about um, these kind of a wonderful movement of these pieces, uh, especially as a pop-up opens, the sort of simple movement of the paper. Um, I hope that some of these are inspiring to you. Go ahead and check out the links in the description below. Um, I'm excited to catch up with you guys in the studio and see where, uh, where your designs take you.